Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, President of FICI and President of South Asia and a member of the Executive Board globally for Unilever. Mr. Subarkant Panda, President-elect for FICI and Menacing Director of Indian Metals and Ferro Alloys. And then finally, Dr. Anish Shah, Vice President FICI and Menacing Director and CEO of Mahindra and Mahindra. And sorry, don't want to forget Arun Chawla, Director General of FICI. I'm Paul Polman, the former global CEO of Unilever and author of a new book called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. Well, I was thrilled when my dear friend Sanchev asked me to address you for this very important event. I have great admiration for Sanchev, both as a dear friend, but also an amazing business leader. As a former chair of the Global International Chambers of Commerce, Vicky is also close to my heart. Equally during my time as CEO of Unilever, I had the opportunity to visit your country extensively and to meet with the current and former leaders in government, in business and witness firsthand, may I say, the enormous transformation you've helped bring about. You are a strong institution that has actively changed the face of India over its nearly 100 years of existence. Not only have you, as FICA, led on many initiatives to drive a more sustainable and equitable growth, it is also starting to be reflected, I believe, in the national policies itself. There's equally full admiration for India and especially Mr. Modi's leadership through uncertain times, both nationally and increasingly at the global states as well. Well, every decade has its story, its trends and big events. We're two years in our current decade and some of these stories are starting to emerge clearly. A big one is instability and the interlinked nature of the crisis we face. The words of the year that describe this best are polycrisis and permacrisis. A polycrisis is where a number of depressing factors have combined to create one big alarming super situation. And a permacrisis is an extended period of instability and insecurity. I think we can all see that the period of relative geopolitical calm is over, at least for now. I do hope, though, that as Prime Minister Modi recently wrote in the Telegraph newspaper, that our era need not be one of war. By now, the conflict in the Ukraine, unfortunately, has displaced millions of people and sent a shockwave through the global economy and shows no sign of ending. India, as an increasingly important member of our global community, is not excluded from that. You saw pickup in inflation, reduced exports, and higher level of import cost. These are just some of the indicators. COVID, we know, is not over either. The direct result of the destruction of our biodiversity. It should not have been a black swan event. We had SARS, Zika, Ebola, Asian flu. And yes, there are most likely a few more waiting around the corner. And climate change is definitely with us. India, again, not excluded. Devastating floods, droughts, erratic monsoons, sea level rises. And it's moving faster, unfortunately, than we are. And so are its costs. Globally, inequality is equally on the rise. Extremism is on the rise. Nationalism is on the rise. All while trust is in decline. On many issues, I have to say, in many places across the world, unfortunately, our politics is stuck. The shape and pattern of international trade are also changing rapidly. And the effect of it all is uncertainty and upheaval, which threatens our common values and, I believe, our shared future. And that makes it harder to do good business and build the thriving companies that we all aspire to lead. Now, that is one story, and it might not be a very happy one to many. But there is another story, too, that is happening at the same time. A different story, a story of growth, a story of innovation, of ambition, of opportunity, of investments, of renewal, of pride, of jobs. And that's the Indian story. Where I'm sitting, you can't go more than a few days without reading an article telling you that this is the decade of India. The world is in awe of what you are achieving. 
in this highly unpredictable environment. Soon, you'll be the world's third largest economy. Your GDP per capita is expected to more than double by 2031, driving about a fifth of the global growth over that period. We also are encouraged by India's leadership increasingly at the world states, including the leadership you showed at the, and that you're assuming now with the responsibility of the G20 presidency. I always say that with size comes responsibility. Your government is pushing for more ambitious international commitments to phase down fossil fuel at the COP in Egypt. And although we might not have succeeded in this, your efforts were well noted. So were your recent statements from your prime minister calling for an end to Russian aggression in the UK. And indeed also the reassurance that you give that environmental and sustainable uh, focus will be the priority both for you at home as well as abroad. And within India, there are many good things happening that are creating the lessons for others. The digitization of your economy, the progress you're making on decarbonization, decarbonizing your energy sector and ramping up your renewables, the strides forward in regenerative agriculture, just to name a few. Just like any big economy, you have your challenges, not least in eradicating poverty and bringing security and dignity to all parts of Indian society. And of course, we all know that nothing can be taken for granted. No nation is immune to the tectonic shifts that are taking place in geopolitics uh, or in the global economy or in the changing atmosphere in which we operate. But still, the relative stability in your economy, the growth projections in spite of everything going on, the management of COVID, the investments in infrastructure, your growing middle class, the continuous steps to make it easier for foreigners to invest, all things that I think will continue to keep you on the path of success and all things that are not happening by chance. This is a country being led, including by its business leaders, at a time when globally leadership is in too short supply. My question to you is, how are these two stories going to come together? A world in trouble and India going from strength to strength. And more importantly, what role is Indian business in particular going to play in this story? It is one, is it one of being dragged along at slow pace as governments and multilateral institutions collectively struggle to implement the needed changes at pace, often shrinking the pie? Or is it one of actively driving this conversion to a more equitable, inclusive world, thereby growing the pie for all? We all know that not acting is not an option. Deloitte actually puts, just on climate change alone, the price of inaction, staying on business as usual and current trends, it puts the price at $178 trillion extra cost by 2070. Where we, however, to take action and stay close to the one and a half degrees, which many would say is by all means still possible, we are creating an economic opportunity of $43 trillion to the global economy. We're starting to see very clearly that the cost of inaction is starting to significantly outstrip the cost of action. No wonder, therefore, that leading companies are starting to accelerate change. When there are the bigger challenges, they also provide these enormous opportunities to business to actually lead these transitions. I believe that industry more than ever must now support and drive the changes, but more than that, in the absence of governments and multilateral institutions fully functioning, must actually fill that void and actually actively lead that change. Companies that do will be rewarded for it. Companies that don't, I believe, will increasingly be heading to the graveyard of dinosaurs. Of course, governments have a role to play, but they can't do it alone. And they increasingly lack the funding, the innovations, the financial and human resources, and frankly, may I say, 
in many places, as we've seen, the political uh, will. Yet time is running out. The transition to a stable, clean and inclusive economy that we have a limited time to achieve requires us to all step up to reach these tipping points that drive the scale. And it needs to happen at the speed well beyond the technological revolution and at the scale well beyond the industrial revolution. Some might say that the deadline for action is 2070, but it actually isn't, nor is it 2050 or, or, or any of those dates. It is actually 2030. What we do in this decade is going to be uh, decisive if we're going to live longer term or not. Of course, it's not easy. Otherwise, other people would have done it before us. But there's simply no alternatives. You have it in your three Ps, actually, that you're advocating. Profit, people and planet, all reinforcing each other. In my time at Unilever, as Sanchev can testify, we continuously rank number one in the world as most sustainable company twice as high even as companies like Patagonia. We were consistently voted our best place to work in the world. And during that time, we did not shy away from satisfying our shareholders either, with nearly a 300% return over the 10 year period. You can just look at the share price of Hindustan Lever if you want to see the effects in your country alone. I believe that the opportunities now are bigger even than they were then aided by accelerated technology, signals from the marketplace, changing regulatory frameworks, and frankly, as I mentioned, the higher cost of not acting. This is becoming the business opportunity of the century. Despite what the press or politicians sometimes want us to hear, the forces of change are really starting to converge, in my opinion. More governments are waking up to the climate emergency and setting serious targets and putting policies in place. More investors are actually decarbonating their portfolio and driving money towards this green conversion. More industries have signed up to science-based targets. More coalitions are forming, where CEOs are coming together to, to deal with the tougher challenges, like the uh, Mission Possible uh, Coalition or the First Mover Coalition, where hard to abate industries like shipping, aviation, a cement get together to decarbonize their business models. Not surprisingly, with more evidence every year that companies that score higher on ESG also perform better, we see the pace of change accelerating. And the signals of the marketplace are there. Citizens around the world only want to work for companies that have a deeper purpose, more than just making money, and increasingly want to buy from companies that are part of the solution, not part of the problem. I believe that we've seen more momentum in the last five years than in the last 50 years combined. But as I mentioned before, we're still not moving fast enough. And it's in business's clear interest, in my opinion, to make sure that we accelerate. That's why we wrote the book Net Positive, how courageous companies thrive by giving more than they take to help companies seize these opportunities and bring scale and speed to our collective efforts. In essence, net positive companies thrive by giving more than they take. It's not enough anymore, in my opinion, to run a company that is a little bit less bad or does a little bit less harm through conventional corporate social responsibility. At a time when we already have significantly overshot our planetary boundaries, living well beyond our means, Simply being less bad won't cut it anymore. It doesn't help us fix our problems. Young people won't have it. Your children won't forgive you for it. And increasingly, I believe your shareholders are demanding more ambition from all of us. The days we live for now demand that companies that actually actively restore or repair or regenerate our world and our societies are the ones that we need to embrace. And that's the idea behind net positive. It's about making profits from solving the world's problems, not creating them. It's about leaving the world in a better place than you actually found it. Taking carbon out of the air, creating more nature and biodiversity again, 
replenishing water, creating more equity, advancing science, democracy, and truth. Yes, it is about taking responsibility for your company's total impact in this world, including your indirect impacts across your value chain. It is about serving all of your stakeholders, workers, customers, suppliers, the local community, the planet, even the future generations, in order to build the lasting value over the long term, including for your investors. And it is about setting audacious targets that the world actually needs, not just the ones you can deliver or can get away with. It is about using your power and influence, not to lobby for special favors with your governments, but to give your politicians the confidence that if they are bold, if they find ways to break the political stalemate, business is actually with them. And ultimately, it's about you being the systems thinkers and partnering with others, even sometimes your competitors and your fiercest uh, critics, if I want to, to drive these more transformative changes. As I said, it's not easy, but increasingly within our reach and badly needed. We have the money, we have the technology, and increasingly we have the economic incentives to move. What we now need is the willpower. Some people say that this is not a crisis of climate change or food security or poverty. These are actually symptoms. Some people would argue that the real crisis is one of greed, of selfishness, of apathy. And so the solution, in my opinion, above all, has to move more towards moral leadership and willpower, towards courage, which actually comes from the Latin word core or heart. Gandhi says, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. We need not to wait to see what others do. Our world desperately needs more of the right leaders, leaders that are able to drive the tipping points, leaders who operate with a higher level of empathy, integrity, and ambition, leaders who actually can see the bigger picture and who are motivated to putting themselves in the service of others, understanding that by doing so, they're better off themselves as well. After all, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. In Fiki, I believe, we're therefore blessed. Blessed to have all of you. Your willpower and your uh, leadership has already helped build a tremendous society in India, built incredible iconic companies. And again, you're in the driver's seat of one of the most extraordinary chapters in Indian's history. You are transforming your nation and with ambition, your companies, I believe, can play a huge role in transforming the world as well. If not now, when? If not India, who? And to quote the great Mahatma Gandhi once more, very simply, the future depends on what we do today. I thank you very much, and I hope to see you all in the not too distant future. Enjoy your getting together and your meetings. Thank you very much.